Um, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Medhat Nas. I am the research lead for Saskatchewan Beekeepers Association or Commission. Uh, before that, I was Alberta provincial apiculturist uh, for about uh, 19 years. And uh, been around was for as long as maybe 30 years. So it's a very good uh, group here and they have a uh, lots of activities. And thanks to COVID, I actually encourage us to have this kind of mini conferences. And that's very helpful. Brings a lot of good speakers uh, to share their experience and information with the audience here. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. And tonight, actually, we have two subjects. I think maybe this is the first time for me to hear them. And for me, as a person deal with beekeeper for the last uh, 40, 50 years, it's quite important, especially for the local association, to understand the value of the association, how to bring more people to attend, how to bring good speakers, and how to carry successful organization. And definitely we have the best of our people to speak about these subjects. Before we start, I will ask Ethan to say a few words about WAS and uh, the activities of WAS. Ethan. Uh, sounds good. Uh, so I haven't been on one of these in a while. I've, uh, I'm leading a really busy life right now, but uh, things are hopefully uh, going to go well. Uh, my bees are waking up from uh, from winter finally. Uh, but what I was going to talk about is the uh, just quickly on the conference uh, that we're going to be holding in Calgary uh, late September, so September 29th, the 30th, and the 1st of October. Uh, so we've set up a decent uh, website. I started posting uh, info on our speakers. Uh, I'm starting to design with the help of Ron and the team, uh, the, I guess the, the way the speakers are going to be set up and the workshops on the Friday. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, we're starting to get some sponsors too, to, to help us, uh, pay for the event and control the costs. Uh, and, uh, I'm hoping to have the draft uh, program out uh, very shortly. Uh, one of the twists uh, that I am trying to get organized is an event on the Friday, and it's about bringing the uh, tech transfer folks from across Canada and a few extension education folks from the U.S. Uh, to come meet and do a working day uh, on the Friday. Uh, one is to help me bring some speakers in, but also to, uh, to help get the groups working together to, uh, to improve collaboration, uh, to identify some of their, I guess, their critical issues. Uh, and in most places, it's, it's trying to attract funding. Uh, one of the challenges with these tech transfer groups is they can get funding for programs, but most of them don't cover admin or overheads. So it makes uh, for holding real professionals difficult in a lot of places. So anyways, we'll have a lot of different topics uh, on the conference itself. We'll have things uh, uh, traditional. So it is in Alberta. So we're going to do wintering. Uh, we'll have uh, indoor, outdoor wintering, wood with insulation, four way wraps, poly hives. Uh, one of our directors from Alaska, so I'll be encouraging her to, to present on indoor wintering in Alaska for hobbyists versus commercials. Uh, so she set up a shed up in Fairbanks uh, to winter her bees. So we're going to have a lot of different topics uh, around nutrition, health, uh, diseases, uh, approaches. And uh, I guess our target is about 150 to 200 people. Uh, it's ambitious, but uh, we've got to aim high. So if you're interested, uh, I'll post the the link to the website uh, in the chat. Uh, feel free to visit. Uh, just so you know, we do have a rate, a special rate for the hotel until August. Uh, I did book some rooms, so they are starting to go. Uh, and to get that special coupon rate, I guess uh, once you register, you do get access to that. And we'll be holding the price at 
uh, for you Americans, it's fairly cheap. Uh, so $150 Canadian. Uh, and then it will go up uh, sometime in August uh, as we get closer. So uh, the early bird is, is still for a while yet. So I'll leave it at that. Any questions, you can email me anytime you want. I'm happy to, to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, okay, I'll, uh, for our attendee, just uh, if you have any question, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, that way, our speakers, they have access to the questions. And if they don't have time to um, answer it on the screen, they can later on answer uh, in the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, it's my pleasure to ask the first speaker here uh, to... <clears throat> introduce herself and tell us a little bit about the her activities and the subject she's going to talk about. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Medhat. And thank you, uh, WAS, for asking me to come out and speak to this group. I really enjoy it. And I've, I have been to some WAS conferences. They are always uh, good activities to um, attend. You learn a lot. It's always good to hear from speakers from across the country. So I encourage people to check out the date of the WAS conference and, and attend. So my name is Michelle Colopy. I'm the executive director of Lead for Pollinators, which is a nonprofit that I founded in 2020, right before the pandemic. Uh, and the mission of Lead for Pollinators is really, really utilizing my beekeeping interest and my nonprofit training and experience to provide leadership, education, action, and development, hence LEAD, to support the health and sustainability of honeybees, native pollinators, and the keepers of the ecosystem. So we provide, uh, whether it's fiscal sponsorship for nonprofits uh, or, or clubs that act like a nonprofit but don't have the IRS categorization, uh, we provide strategic planning, we provide education, and we are taking, we help groups or work with other and collaborate with other groups on action-related advocacy. We are working in Massachusetts to change some um, mosquito control legislation, and we've had great success across four years. And um, I'm working locally also trying to, we tried to save some wetlands, and now we also work to get some decent candidates locally elected who are concerned about the environment and we're holding some community meetings so that we can make some changes environmentally how land is used in our in this urban community. So uh, there are a variety of things that uh, we can help beekeeping associations with. Feel free to check out our website at Lead for Pollinators. Uh, I come here with a deep education and training in nonprofit work across my 27 year career in nonprofits. But for about the last oh, 12 years, I've been working in pollinator issues and beekeeping issues. So it has certainly in all that experience, it really uh, came to the forefront for me in noticing the issues in, and I was afraid my screen would freeze up because we hadn't done anything. So I may have to stop sharing and come back in. Let me see, nope, my keyboard's on. So, there we go. So sustainable bee clubs do begin with leadership. And would, there are far too many of us who think we all know how to be on boards. We do not. If we do not, we all bring our myths. We bring what we think should, we should do on a board. We bring our own personal agendas. We bring our own baggage of how to deal with groups. But when you are being a leader on a nonprofit board, You've got to be accountable to your fellow board members, to your membership, and yes, to the government. You want to be transparent in your actions. You want to be responsible. You've got to be efficient. You certainly want to follow the law. Um, you've got to be inclusive. You want to participate. You want to make sure as no matter if you're an officer or a committee member, you want to participate in your club. That is what makes good governance and leadership. So the when we uh, certainly, as I, as I talk about these things, we're going to talk about the value of the mission. We're going to talk about ethical leadership. We're going to talk about connecting those qualified volunteers to the needed skill sets of the club. We don't need to just bring on people who can barely fog a mirror. 
You want to bring people who have those needed skill sets. We want to understand the legal responsibilities of being a board member because there are legal responsibilities. You are liable as a board member for the actions of your fellow board members. There are governance policies that you should make sure that are developed. You want to protect the organization. You want to protect you as a board member and your fellow board members and the members of the B Club. You as a board member want to be the example of ethical, legal, responsive, sustainable beekeeping leadership. I've done a lot of these presentations for master beekeeping groups, which it makes sense if you're a master beekeeper, then you are an obvious leader in your club. So if you are a leader as a master beekeeper, that also needs to be with a, the leadership of the administration of the beekeeping association. And then we'll have Q&A, as they said earlier, either um, asking directly during the session or through the uh, Q&A in the Zoom setup. Now, certainly in uh, being ethical, um, you want to realize one of those first and foremost things is not to steal other beekeepers' ideas or presentations. That's unethical. So that when we have presentations, whether they have that copyright symbol or not, whether there is a statement at the bottom that says it's a copyrighted pres protected presentation, we must, as board members, protect our speakers that we bring to clubs and make sure that our members are not just lifting um, images and using them in their own presentations, because again, that's unethical. So when we look at understanding our mission, look at the, the mission of your B Club. Typically, they are to provide education and awareness and uh, support to the members around beekeeping in a specific county or a state or a province. So make sure that you understand your mission. Maybe it needs updated because many of us are still working on bee club bylaws from 1970s. Some people are still working on the same bylaws from the 1930s. I know clubs that are still working on their original bylaws and they also have five dollars in member dues you need to modernize you need to be aware of what is your mission and making sure that you are serving a public or mutual benefit because it's not about benefiting the board members they are not there to sell their own bees that's not why they're on the board they are not there to sell their own uh, beekeeping classes they are there to serve the entire membership of the club, and that is that service. And as we were chatting before the um, meeting started, the uh, gentleman, uh, Etienne, who is working on the WAS conference, he did acknowledge that, yes, if you are a leader in your beekeeping association, often your beekeeping is going to suffer for while you are a leader, because if you are a good leader, if you are an attentive leader, then yes, your beekeeping is not going to get as much attention because being a good leader, a responsible, ethical leader of a beekeeping association, whether it's the county level, the uh, state level, the regional level, national level, you are going to be busy. It's sometimes not a part-time job. Sometimes you are putting in 40 hours a week, and I'm sure Debbie can attest to that between her state association and working with ABF that she spends more time doing all this nonprofit stuff with the associations, sometimes more than her bees. And that is, that's what happens when you are an ethical, responsible beekeeper who is on a board and you are taking those responsibilities seriously. So you want to, with that mission, look at that status quo. Is it really working with how your organization the, and the needs of that organization just because you've always done it that way? Please, let's stop that. So, Because beekeeping has changed. We know it has changed. You will hear all of the beekeepers say that, well, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, I could put my boxes out in a field and come back in three months and they were full of honey. We know we can't do that anymore for a variety of reasons. We were talking about wildfires earlier. That's one reason. It's also about mites and other diseases. It's about theft. It's about uh, uh, bears and other predators. So there are a variety of reasons that we cannot do things even in beekeeping management the way we've always done it. 
things have changed. And the same with our nonprofit organizations, our bee clubs. We cannot run our bee club the way our 1972 bylaws say, oh, well, here's the agenda. This is what we'll do. You can't. Uh, we have newer people coming in, people with diverse skills. Beekeeping is not just a rural um, activity anymore. It is very much an urban activity. More women are involved. Younger people are involved. So as you look at your meeting agenda, even, is it serving the needs of your club? Just because it's, and God help you, if it's written in your bylaws of the agenda to follow, change those bylaws <laughs> because that is not the way to have an agenda. It must be flexible. It should not be um, enshrined in your bylaws. Robert's <clears throat> Rules of Order also. You know, people love to use that phrase, but if you get into the nitty gritty of Robert's rules, uh, I was working with a group that was redoing their bylaws and within it, uh, we were discussing how do we remove a member who is a, maybe a problematic member? Well, within Robert's rules, if you are um, in a sense holding a, a hearing to remove a member, then the person who is being challenged can only have an attorney from within the membership. They can't bring an outside attorney. And that's part of Robert's rules. So you really have to have a parliamentarian, but you can get so bogged down. Do not use just Robert rules. Again, not something that needs to be part of your bylaws. Choose a, a format. There are many guidelines out there to manage a meeting, but don't just go, let's have Robert's rules unless you really understand it. Otherwise there will be a cranky person who does know Robert's rules and they will just hog tie your organization. Now, I bring this one up because years ago I, I did an article in Bee Culture Magazine and I was asking people about bee clubs and the changes they wanted and the problems they saw. And this is one that popped up a lot. And I know this is for many folks, someone has told me this is poking people in the eye. But the issue again goes back to is your agenda are your bylaws outdated? Because is prayer a place in a bee club? Unless you're the Christian bee club or the Jewish bee club or the Muslim bee club or the, uh, you know, the Quaker bee club, why are you doing a prayer at your bee club? Unless you, again, are the Christian beekeepers of, you know, Summit County. Okay, then that suits your mission. But if it's not really part of your mission, why are you alienating people of different faiths. So just because it's in your bylaws, it doesn't mean you should do it. Again, assess your bylaws. Is it working? Is it not? Is it offensive to some people? I realize some people who like the prayer find it offensive to take it out. However, again, look at your mission. And if you are a public serving organization, then maybe you can take that out. Outdated auxiliary groups. That would be um, any of the um, subcommittees that are often titled um, the Women's Auxiliary Group, which goes back to the history of beekeeping, that it typically was men who were doing the beekeeping and women did the knitting and the cooking and all the honey recipes and things. So they were called auxiliary. Well, now we have a lot of women who are taking on beekeeping. And again, calling a, a subcommittee just an auxiliary group is just outdated and a little offensive. So again, assess the status quo, assess your organization, grow, learn, welcome people, because that's really what you want to do is welcome that diversity into beekeeping. You want to certainly maintain your members and your donors' trust. Now, they're uh, in Ohio uh, and in California here. They do have some guides for um, the board members. You can go to the attorney general website. I know Canada does a similar thing. You can get uh, guides for charity board members. And it basically comes down to about four things. Your role as a board member is the duty of care. You are there to understand the mission and support the mission of the bee club you are representing, and you are there to care for it and make sure its reputation stays good so that all of your own reputation stay good. You are there to have that sense of loyalty to the bee club. So again, you as a beekeeper are not supposed to personally benefit. You know, if, if you do sell bees and you're on the board, 
everybody in your club who sells bees must be al allowed to promote that they sell bees. Can't be just you as, say, the vice president. You have to have a duty of loyalty to the entire club that you chair and welcome everybody in the club, whether they have a bee business, whether they um, you know, sell bees. Um, you have to welcome everybody who can share that information with the rest of the board and with the rest of the membership. You want to have a duty. You must have a duty to manage the accounts. And I know Debbie and I have had, Debbie Seib, who's the second speaker, she and I have had many discussions about managing the accounts because you must be fiscally accountable. And every board member is, not just the treasurer. I've been a treasurer. I know Debbie's been a treasurer. Still is a treasurer, I think, aren't you, Debbie? Um, and it is not just the treasurer's responsibility. It is the treasurer's responsibility to encourage everybody else to be ethical but it is all of the board members who must understand and track the budget data. They must support and help the treasurer establish and monitor those internal controls. And everybody must be fair and equal. If you're seeking reimbursements for something, everybody has to use the same reimbursement form. I've had um, board members who submitted a reimbursement form on the back of a flyer because they just didn't, and in pencil, and they didn't even want to fill out the reimbursement form everyone else does. Nope, I was just supposed to do it that way. There is a duty of compliance, because again, the treasurer has to answer to the IRS when they submit that 990. Typically, the board president will also sign that 990, but it is the entire board who is responsible also for ensuring they are compliant with state and national guidelines to ensure they maintain their nonprofit status. So that if you're a national organization as a nonprofit, uh, ABF is, but they are a member association. So thankfully they don't have to register in 40 different states in order to raise money. But if you are a 501c3 national nonprofit and you raise money across the country, you actually have to register in 40 different states in order to raise money. If you are just working in your own state, you must register with at least your secretary of state. There are a few states like here in Ohio where you have to be compliant and register with the secretary of state and the attorney general. So you as a board member should also be aware what are those compliance guidelines, one, to support your treasurer, and sometimes also to help your treasurer know about those things. Ask the questions. Are we registered with everybody we need to register with? But it is the responsibility of every board member. And I will tell you, like with California, they actually fine the board members and they make the board members pay $10,000 if you are a California nonprofit and you have not registered in the state of California. They make the board members pay the fine. So again, that's where you are responsible. So there are, again, these wonderful guides out there. They're fairly short. They really are. Uh, but it is vital that board members understand their role as a board member because you are there to do work for the organization. You're volunteering, yes, but it is work. You are running committees. You are managing committee members. You have projects to do. You are fundraising. You are showing up at meetings. The standard is if you miss three consecutive meetings with no valid excuse, and and I'm a, a little hard sometimes, unless you're dead, that's a valid excuse. If you're really ill or a close family member is ill, um, or again, you know things that you're going to be on vacation or something ahead of time, but you convey that to the rest of the board at the beginning of the year. But if you just choose to, as I've seen board members do, go to dinner and then they post on Facebook, on the beekeeping association social media, oh, we went out to dinner. Instead of going to the board meeting, yeah, you need to be kicked off the board. You mean need to be asked to step down because you're obviously not taking this very seriously and you're not representing your fellow board, board members or your membership well. So you want to make sure you can take the time and make the time for being a good, responsible board member. Because certainly ethical leadership does start with, um, I need to move our faces, there we go, needs to start with those cultural approaches, really, so that it starts with everybody on the board. Certainly it starts with the leadership, the president, 
committee chairs, committee chairs have to encourage their committee members to be ethical about things. And it takes the entire leadership of the board to encourage, yes, through peer pressure, to be ethical. So that if you have a reimbursement form for travel to the state house because you're doing uh, beekeeping um, advocacy or travel to the state fair or reimbursement for expenses for the, the field day or the bee school, of course, those reimbursed expenses must be approved within the budget. But use the form the treasurer creates and everybody has to use the same form. And if someone, one of the board members consistently refuses to use that form, the rest of the board members need to say, you know what, Sally Mae, you really should use the form the rest of us do. Sorry if it's hard for you, but you have no excuse. Because typically, and I know I've done this, I'm sure Debbie has as a treasurer, you can get an online reimbursement form, you can print it and fill it in and still send it to the treasurer. So the treasures are flexible based on people's um, computer skills. However, don't send a reimbursement request on the back of a flyer because it's not going to get fulfilled. It just won't. Because, and again, the rest of the board needs to support the treasurer. Um, I, I've, I've had those people that I've had to, I've you know, asked them to provide me privately I've asked them privately to provide me with the appropriate form. When they didn't after three times, I took it to the entire board. For some folks, even public shaming doesn't work. So again, that's where the rest of the board has to either demand it or say, then you're not getting reimbursed, Sally Mae, because you're refusing to fill out the reimbursement form the rest of us have to do. So you've got to have that peer commitment to the ethics on the board, especially when you're managing other people's money. And I think that's key is you must understand this is other people's money you are responsible for as board members, not your money. It's not the committee's money. It's not the treasurer's money. It's the board's money. It's the, it's, it, the board is responsible for the members' money. It is their money and you must manage it well. So you've got to embed these ethical values. And sometimes that might put the board president especially in a tough position to call somebody aside and say, you know what, uh, your ethics are causing problems for the rest of us. But it's you have to have that commitment if you want to maintain your own good reputation as a beekeeper and as a leader. So certainly the um, ethics and accountability it's set by the standards for excellence in nonprofits. So this isn't just something I'm coming up with. This is a standard for excellent nonprofits. So the board's responsible for its own operations. Certainly reassess yourself, evaluate your own performance after every project, evaluate it. What worked, what didn't, what can we improve? That is how we grow our businesses even. And this is the same thing you're going to do with your nonprofit B club. You're going to have those stated performance expectations for board members especially. They need to know what they, what they should do, what they're supposed to do. So put people on committees, but have job descriptions of what they are going to do. No one wants to volunteer when they don't know what they're going to do. So you've got to have these uh, guidelines for folks have job descriptions. Yes, volunteering is work. And in the professional world of volunteer management, that people usually apply. So you wanna have a nominating process that um, certainly you're going to make sure what skills you need from people and hopefully they have those skills, but don't bring people on the board just because they fog a mirror or barely fog a mirror because you wanna make sure you are supporting the nonprofit organization and serving your members to the best. So if you have someone who's running for an office position, we'll say secretary, but they don't have access to the internet or it's really sketchy, they don't know how to use email, they cannot type, but their wife can do all of that. Well, then guess what? The wife needs to run for the position, not the husband. So you need to, as a nominating committee, they need to be strong enough to say, these are the clear guidelines of what we need for board positions. And this is this, this next thing is one of those myths people think they must follow. Your bylaws may say, we have to have seven people on our board. 
You can have a maximum of seven per your bylaws, yes. But according to the state, now here in Ohio, we can have a minimum of three and we're good and we can keep functioning. Because why put dead wood on your board just because for some reason it says you could have seven? If you do not have a total of seven qualified people who will be ethical, responsible, and do the work, then don't put them on the board. They will just frustrate the ones who do the work. They will create a bad reputation for the organization, and your members will not be happy with them. And eventually, even with the, the people doing the work, your members won't be happy with them either. So just because your bylaws say you should, you can have a maximum number of people, that's just the maximum number of people. But if you don't have someone running for vice president, then don't fill it with someone who can barely fog a mirror. So you want to establish some rigorous board development strategy for recruiting, and it goes back to the nominating committee. I say this every time to clubs, don't stand in the front of the club meeting and say, we need people to run for the board. Why? If you're going to stand up there, say, why? What are the goals? What are the duties for these people? What will they do? Just standing there and, and yelling it out, somebody sign up. Who wants to do that? Who do what? Be inspirational. Get to know your members. Encourage them based on the skill sets you see them displaying. Because I will tell you, I run into so many CPA beekeepers and attorney beekeepers who refuse to even raise their hand because the organization uh, doesn't have DNO insurance, directors and officers liability insurance. And um, those licensed people, the lawyer and the CPA, don't want to risk their license and reputation because. The club is tip often run poorly. You could use their skills if you have job descriptions and if you are an ethically run responsible board. You've got to have those board policies that should limit their terms of board members. I'm a two-termer. I like two terms. That's it. You move up, move on. Um, that's, that experience is wonderful. You can still participate after your two terms on a committee as an as a, you a, a volunteer member, but two terms on the board. We should not have clubs run by the same people for 30 and 40 years. That becomes their private club. So the board resp is responsible also for orienting and educating their board members about the goals, about their job duties, um, and make sure that they understand what are their, their duty of care and compliance and loyalty. Make sure they understand their responsibilities and the need for ethics as a leader. Now this, this little social media post I like to bring up to people because it was during an election when uh, for obviously um, the president of the club and the little X's with the white are where I blocked out the name of the club, but this was posted on social media. Now we all know that when you requeen a hive, you're killing the, the queen. So this person, even in the lower corner there, created a grave with a cross. And this, they were encouraging everyone to vote for this other person. Now, the issue with this becomes, and it's a responsibility again of the board to nip these things in the bud, is this grave with the cross, could be seen as almost a hate crime, considering the one person who, um, this uh, was Christian and the current um, president was Jewish. So there should be some gasps at home because this is highly inappropriate as social media post. This is when the board needs to take action. They should have pulled this off. These, it was a state association. They should have pulled that off that state association's social media page. And they actually should have removed the person who created this um, cartoon from the organization, even if it's for a couple of years, whatever the process is, because this is offensive. It is bullying. Um, it you know, could be seen as anti-Semitic based on um, who the two people running for the president of the association were. So this is one of those responsibilities board members don't want to take on. But if you have policies, that helps you. But you have to address these things sometimes. You have to, sadly address some of these things. Because finding the right board members is so important. As you can see, you know, why don't we have any fresh ideas? 
because we keep bringing up the same people. Now, often many of our folks who are leaders have been the same people, but if it's been two terms, we've got to recruit other folks. We've got to mentor other people. Certainly committees is the best way to do that so that you can find that diversity. We have diverse members now. We really do. So we've got to get them based on certainly their skills, because that's what volunteerism is all about. What are the skills they can give to the organization? So you've got to find those right board members who does well on a committee. You get to know them, um, support what they're doing. Tell people you've done a great job at the, at the state fair booth or the county uh, field day. You know, tell people that you think they would be a good leader. Would they like to run for the board? People love to be appreciated and asked. So do that. Because it is more than just a nominating committee of, yeah, you know, we'll just go with the same people we have now. No, that's two terms. They should go. Have a nominating committee that has a nominating form. Do people have the skills for the position they're running for? Again, if they're running for secretary, they need to know how to take notes, to do email, to disperse the meeting minutes, to respond to correspondence, um, to possibly keep the records if they're treasurer. They need to know how to manage maybe QuickBooks. So they need to understand how to do the position they are, they are running for. And it's important to ask people. Right? People like to be appreciated. Ask them specifically if they will run. And I'm saying, like, go to Debbie Saib and say, Debbie, I have seen you at the state fair. You do a great job at that, honey, Booth. I think you'd be great on our committee for this, uh, you know, for our state conference. Can you help us? She would be thrilled just to be appreciated and noticed. Now, whether she has the time to do what I ask her, she might say no, but I'm happy to be on a committee. <clears throat> but you have to ask people. You have to ask them. And that's one-on-one, -on -one, not yelling at the front of the room to the herd of beekeepers. So certainly it's all about uh, diversifying um, our efforts as well. We have a lot of different folks now coming into beekeeping. So you want, as an outstanding board member, somebody who's got that pre-existing passion for the cause. You want somebody who's eager to participate at every board meeting. Again, if they've missed three consecutive meetings with no excuse or reason, thank them very much for their service. But obviously at this time in their lives, they are too busy and maybe they can apply and be on the board in another year when their lives calm down. And it's sometimes helpful to give somebody that out because they can't say no. Some of us can't say no to things. So it is up to the board to be to help that person say, you know what, you know, I appreciate <clears throat> wanting to be on the board, but you just don't have the time right now. You've certainly as a board member, you want to prepare ahead for meetings. So if you have a treasurer or a committee person sending out a uh, report ahead of time, read it, read the report, be respectful of someone who took that time to prepare a report so that you are prepared to ask questions. I've actually sat at a board meeting where everyone was quiet for 15 minutes while they read the board report. Don't do that. Read the report ahead of time. Again, show respect for others because you would want them to read any report you provided. You want to be anxious to serve on committees. Again, it's about using your skills to the best for the uh, organization. That's why you're on the board. So be anxious to serve on committees. You want to Sometimes if you can give above average financially, if you're able to um, start a fundraising campaign, if you are able to uh, provide a scholarship for 4-H kids or start that fundraising for a 4-H, that is something that board members really are supposed to do. You've got to have that strong desire to be a steward to others. You are there for the members and the organization, not yourself. You are there to serve the membership. and. You want to be supportive of the club, but also the club needs you to be objective, to have your own opinion and be able to express it, but not in a bullying way. You want to discuss what the issues are about whether it's making a purchase for equipment um, or you know, providing more support for 4-H. Express your own opinion, have it conversational, learn from each other, and you want to always, again, like with treasure reports, if you don't understand them, the treasurer is thrilled to help you understand it. They want their board members to understand the financials because it is your responsibility 
who understand them as well as the treasurer. So those attributes of being a good leader, certainly great directors are goal-driven and have that high degree of motivation and energy. We need doers. We need self-starters. We need doers on our B-clubs as leaders. You've got to have that passion for the mission of the organization because that is what you are attending to constantly, is the mission of the organization. You've got to be willing to accept and motivate others. Again, our, our clubs are so diverse. We've all run into those new beekeepers who are so passionate. And, you know, they're always painting their hives in different ways and positioning them. And, you know, they read one thing and they move the hive a different place. And then there are those who sing to their hives. And accept everybody in their love of beekeeping, motivate others to continue to learn, to inspire others, to bring others into the club, because education, sharing among our club members, as well as the educational speakers we bring in, is vital to sustaining the organizations, to sustaining that fellowship of our bee clubs. And again, as a board member, you've got to be that servant leader, and I know that can be tough, but you are there to give to others rather than getting any from, anything from the organization. What you get is the excitement and the fulfillment of truly meeting the needs of your club, of taking that passion of those uh, bee club members and getting them to really love beekeeping and to learn more and to go to not just say a, a state conference, go to a regional one, go to a, 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 like a WASC conference, that's where we are being those servant leaders, encouraging people to keep going with their education and to learn more. You have to be able to deal well with conflict, like uh, dealing with that person who might have written a Facebook post that is really offensive. Um, you have to be able to deal with those things. It does help, one, to have perspective, and two, most importantly, have policies in order to deal with it. And as you're looking at how you deal in your community or um, strategically looking to expand your club or to collaborate with other groups, think about things tactically and strategically. What can you do to make change in your community, whether it's developing beekeeping laws, whether it's working with the chicken people to support what they do as well, whether it's addressing also just broader pollinator issues. How can you as a beekeeping organization work together with um, other groups to help encourage new members to beekeeping, as well as collaborate with other groups in your community. You've got to have that financial acumen. You really do. You have to understand the finances and nobody on the board should ever say, oh, I don't understand all that balance sheet and profit and loss statement. <laughs> Learn it because it is about your reputation as well. And I'll tell you, treasurers want the rest of their board to understand the finances because they don't ever want to hear, oh, well, that's just, you know, Bob's a treasurer and he just gets, he's such a stickler about, you know, every penny. Yes, you want him to be, but it's other people's money and you are responsible for other people's money. Fundraising, you want to do it ethically. You want to make sure that you're sharing the, the goals of fundraising and what you've done with those funds. Again, with your members, so that you are transparent, and again, make sure you are legally raising money appropriately in your state. Between raffles, whether it's a bingo, whether it's auctions, check with your state if you have any sales taxes you have to pay. Um, if you have you know, products and things you're selling, some things uh, you have to pay sales tax on. Yes, or that whole agricultural forgiveness kind of thing. Check with your state sales tax department. I was with a nonprofit who should have been paying sales tax for four years, and they weren't. We had to catch up. So you, you can have those additional products that, yes, you as an organization have to pay sales taxes if you are selling them. So make sure, again, with your fundraising that you are compliant with the state and with tax laws as well. Just because you're a nonprofit does not mean you don't have to pay taxes. On some things you do. You're not paying taxes on your total revenue you raise every year. However, if you are selling things like videos, if you are selling tchotchkes, if you um, sometimes with even uh, auction items, raffle things, you might have some sales taxes involved based on the gifts donated to you. So check with your state sales tax department or a CPA. Don't guess at it. Unless you're a CPA or an attorney, please do not make a uh, an accounting or a legal 
excuse or rationalization. Check with the professionals because you want to protect the entire board and all of your board members. So actively listen to people. If they have a concern that you're trying to play attorney, don't find an attorney so that you get the legal, um, truly the legal facts for any decision that will help you make any decision. So use that sound judgment. Don't guess at this. Please don't guess at this. I have too many people who think, again, they know how to be a board member. And I'll tell you, across 27 years, they're always wrong. I don't care if they are a judge. I don't care if they are. An, so, but typically people do not know how to be a nonprofit board member. They too, they need that training. They must be responsible for everybody. And you want to use that sound judgment. Get all the information you need to make a sound decision. And be persistent in getting that information, as well as in addressing any problems in the organization. Just don't walk away from it. Don't just forget about it. You've got to deal with these things. That is your responsibility to protect the organization. And certainly as any of you who've worked a state fair booth or a county fair booth or a field day, boy, you got to have some stamina. So <laughs> make sure you can do that. Manage things for your health, but work with your fellow board members so everybody is working together to share that workload. You've got to keep that board strong through diversity, and that's diversity in age, in gender, um, in skill level. Certainly, there are sometimes I've been in bee clubs where uh, people are, want to get into beekeeping, but they really just actually enjoy the fellowship. They're learning about bees, but they don't have bees yet because maybe they live on rental property. But welcome them into the club. If they've been a member for three years, whether they have bees or not, they might be a great secretary or a great social media uh, chairperson. So welcome them into the club, into that leadership. Find ways you can recruit community representatives if you need to, someone from 4-H, uh, someone from Extension, as long as they have that interest in the beekeeper's um, mission. Again, set term limits, set those term limits, get people off the board. Set a schedule to review your operations, review your bylaws based on certainly the law with a lot of it. Laws are constantly changing, especially the tax laws. So certainly review those government documents and budgets and policies with new board members. Look at any assessment, evaluate that as to how anything needs to be updated or addressed so that you are protecting the organization and the membership. Developing a strategic plan is always good. Look at those groups that maybe can help you. Sometimes your local extension can help you develop a strategic plan. Most states have a uh, Center for Nonprofit Excellence. They can help you facilitate a strategic, pl strategic plan. Here at Lead for Pollinators, we can do that as well. So it's good to always assess your weaknesses, your strengths, your opportunities and threats. So again, you can make sure you have a sustainable bee club. Certainly the operational and financial policies, they should be there. A good treasurer will want them. Whether the rest of the group wants to think about it or not, it's not the point. You should want them as well. It's not part of your bylaws because you want these things to change. You know, if you're starting with just a checkbook register, but now you're into QuickBooks, okay, your policies are going to change. The operational process of that will change. If now you're getting PayPal or Square or some other online payment system, your policies and procedures are going to change. So you don't want any of these financial things part of the bylaws or constitution. You want these policies and procedures based on what's going on now in your organization so that you're protecting the, the board, the organization, and the money that people are contributing. So it's certainly, these are reference tools that you use, the policies and procedures that help you with ethical decision-making and for dealing with those conflicts. Those policies certainly can paraphrase a law. They can explain a procedure like this is the reimbursement form we're using. This is how you fill it out. This is who you send it to. This is how long I take to review it. And if I have an issue as the treasurer, I will get back to you and then I will send you a check. That's explaining a procedure and a process. So certainly you've got these protocols that you want to have these because it will help diminish embarrassing or harmful situations as well as improper behavior. Because again, if you have someone who refuses to fill out, say a reimbursement form, 
you have that policy that everyone can say, look, Sally Mae, here's the policy. It's part of that. We're all following it. Please do that. And if you do not want to do follow it that way, then you won't get reimbursed. So you're following, you, know, you fall back on that policy, that procedure. And it helps to reduce the stress of people in that confrontational kind of um, atmosphere. But it needs to be fair, fair for everybody. So certainly these governance policies, there are a variety of those. I'm not gonna talk about each one of them. Um, these are things that help you um, protect the organization and manage the paperwork, especially with uh, computers now, you wanna make sure we're retaining documents and they go to the next officers. But also, you know, those financial policies and procedures are important. Social media policy, yep, you should have one. Even simple things of an email signature format. You, you should have that for everybody, all the board members who have a standard way, so it's always their name, their title, how to reach them by phone or email, and maybe even a statement of, I will return an email within 24 hours. So a harassment prevention policy is, is good, not just, and I'm not talking sexual harassment, it can be any harassment. It is bullying from one beekeeper to another. It is, you know, it's those things that help to, again, protect the organization from a lawsuit. Returns, refunds, and cancellations, you need a policy, whether it's refunding conference funds, refunding, um, oh, somebody made a purchase of a video for beekeeping management, or will you accept it or not? You know, you have to have those policies. The alcohol and drug-free workplace, you wouldn't think it, but if you're at a field day or at the state fair and one of your volunteers went over to the uh, beer garden and spent too long over there, and now they come back to the, the beekeeping booth, they shouldn't be selling honey or they should not certainly be doing a bee beard having had too much alcohol. So you have to have that policy so you can say, uh, Bob, you were over at the beer garden for like three hours. So we're going to let somebody else do the, uh, the bee beard. You have to have these guidelines, which makes it so much easier. Um, so it's good to have these policies including how do you remove a board member? How do you remove a board member? And you don't want it of just, you know, whatever we choose. No, really say, what are the reasons for removing somebody? Is it stealing money? Is it um, harming another beekeeper, whether it's their business or themselves personally? Is it, um, you know, putting the organization at risk because they are, lying about the organization, put down in writing those things that are um, reason for censure or removal as a board member. Because you're not just volunteers, you are representing the B Club and your actions have consequences to your fellow board members, to the membership, to the community, but your actions have consequences to your fellow board members. You're responsible, as I've said numerous times, for other people's money. You can tell I was a treasure. Other people's money, it's not yours. So you do, you want to always be transparent with that money so that even if some uh, B Club member says, you know what, I'd like to see the financials. You go, well, I did provide them at the last meeting, but I can email you a copy again. Here you go. Um, so feel free to, to share that with people. Be that honest and transparent and make sure, do you have any questions? Because a lot of people think think they also understand profit and loss sheets and a balance sheet and they don't. So sit down with them, explain it with them, talk through them, talk through it with them. You are responsible as a board member, as a committee member for the reputation of the organization and your fellow board members. You're responsible for that sustainability. And a reputation of the organization. We've all heard the horror stories of uh, B clubs that have reputation problems. And that club is not sustainable. Either it must go away because you can't even carry the name forward, even with new folks, uh, because it's hard to get past the, the bad history of a B club, of any group. Even if it's the quilting group, I don't care if it's the um, uh, let's make uh, wooden figurines group. When the reputation of a nonprofit organization is damaged, it haunts it for a long, long time. 
but your skills, your ethics, your energy, your creativity, your patience, your willing to learn and listen is vital to being a responsible board member. So I'd like to thank everybody. I know there might be questions in the chat. Oh, not too many. Okay, but I can answer those uh, unless Med Hat, you want to, there are only three, uh, read those to me. Or if we want to jump right into um, Debbie's presentation, um, that's up to you. But thank you, everybody. My contact information is there on the slide. You can reach out to my website, contact me at that email. You can also find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle. I, I really enjoyed this talk because okay. I attend several meetings and I tend to sit down in their business part of it to understand how they function. And I can see a lot of their issues. It can be solved by following this kind of uh, roadmap, how to create a nonprofit uh, organization successfully and run it smoothly. Mm -hmm. I think, okay, we can get one or two of the questions before we move into the uh, next speaker. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Carla ask what are some best practices when you have local or regional beekeeping vendors as club officers? Do you think there's conflict of interest? Uh, um, well, uh, it, right there there can be a, a conflict idea. of interest yeah um but certainly if uh, if the board members hopefully it's not every single board member are the only vendors there have to be some club folks some general members they should be allowed to as i said they should be allowed to publicize that yes i have bees or i have bee equipment it has to be everybody if it is only the um board say the board president or a vice president who sells stuff locally, then really that board president could also, and the club needs to demand, you need to also share uh, the other vendors in the area, you know, whether it's Date Ant or Better B, you need to share the other vendors, the information of where people can buy bees, not just that local board member. They have got to diversify it and be fair so there isn't a conflict of interest. Um, or, to, you know, it also helps alleviate that um, some people might feel that they're being bullied to buy bees or bee equipment just from that board member. That's not appropriate. So we know there are plenty of other bee businesses out there. Um, so find at least four or five and promote it at the club. You, you can always reach out. I know um, ABF often they have their magazines which lists a lot of the bee dealers and sometimes ABF will provide magazines um, to the local club so that they can get that information. You can easily contact whether it's Date Ant or uh, Better Bee or Man Lake and say, send us some catalogs and they will send catalogs to your club. That is another way to help share that information. But it should think, not just be the board members. Yeah, uh, like I personally see some people, they use it as being director uh, in the organization uh, as a way and means for actually give them, giving themselves privileges to use that position to market their own product and force it on others or some somehow like that. And I, I witnessed that and I can see it and I see some people, how do you, how do you really control that? Like I can see in your protocol, like, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it starts with a conflict of interest policy that clearly yeah. states board members cannot be the only people selling anything at the clubs because that is self-serving behavior and it is highly unethical. Yeah. So there must be a policy that they follow. And again, if those officers don't want to adhere to that policy, then thank you very much for your service. See you goodbye. Because it is unethical for them to do that. They are self-serving and they are not there for the members. As you just said, they are there to only promote their own business. Okay. The second question, just uh, directly, how do you recruit a good candidate who inspires the folks to run the office and stuff like that? A again, it's you know, getting to know your fellow club members who is serving on a committee. Talk to folks at the, the honey booth when you're volunteering there and find out what they like, the, what their skills are. You'll find somebody who's um, maybe 
teaching beekeeping in another club in another county. You know, find out what other people are doing, but you need to get to know your board members. What are their skills? Would they be interested? But stop just standing at the front of the room saying we need board members, because the next thing you need to say is this is what we need you to do. We need a vice president who's going to then run the meeting, but also is going to chair this committee. And then this is what that person's going to do. So you have to have job descriptions for people. Don't just say we need bodies on the board. What are people going to do? What are they going to do? I think uh, one of the issues that also I witness sometimes because there is no term limit. Right. That kind of in a way it kind uh, Beekeepers in general, they are shy to jump in and, uh, you know, uh, become part of that, uh, say, director's club. But having term limit, it might help also to encourage more people, especially if you know your term is up, to encourage somebody else or train somebody else to start taking some leadership. And uh, right. I see this term limit is quite important. I witnessed some guys been there. Uh, the you know the lead of the club for almost 25 years right right <laughs> and then it becomes their own private club yes we need to have exactly <laughs> um it, it works at the political level i'll tell you so it's a really our clubs are very much its own little political world but we need diverse skills we need people who are term limited and we need to get to know people and elect to office people who have the skills to do the different officer positions to do the committee chairs, we need those skill sets. So we there is not a darn thing wrong with creating job descriptions for each position. You can even have a job description for a greeter at each club meeting. You will stand near the door, greet people, welcome them, send them over to the information table where the cupcakes are. That is a job description for somebody. And there are those people who, that's an easy job, I can do that. Um, there are always those groups, those those beekeepers who are really chatty, love to get to know everybody. Well, then turn them into the greeter, bring them onto a committee, and you start to train people into those leadership roles. And then they realize, yes, I can do these th these other things, and they do move up. Term limits, term limits, and it will happen if the current leadership is willing to train folks, mentor them get to know their membership and is will and are willing to step down last last question here yes. can we get a copy of this presentation to share with our club well it will be on the waas uh, link i'm always happy to come and talk to clubs as well separately so that sometimes it's helpful when i come and talk to clubs directly because i can address some specific issues maybe you are having that you need an outside person to say some things because there's um personality issues maybe in the organization where everyone's thinking it but they don't want to say it you know again you've got somebody who's on the who hasn't attended the last three meetings, how do we get rid of them in that sense? How do you say thank you for your service, but we need somebody who can actually do something? Um, when you've got folks who are just being self-centered, self-serving narcissists, how do you get them off the board? And, and you know, sometimes you also have to look at the structure of the board that you have come on. And if you are a passionate leader, if you are ethical, if you want to be responsible, but everyone around you does not want to do any of those things, then you need to resign from the board. You don't want to damage your reputation in the beekeeping world. You don't want to put yourself through the unhealthy um, interaction with people who are unethical, uh, who are irresponsible. So, Sometimes you have to walk away because the, the culture of the board is one that lacks ethics and responsibility. And even if they are, they have a treasurer who is in collusion with the board president and another officer, and they're just pretty much draining the, um, the bank account, you can resign stating a letter, this is what's going on. You could turn them into the state attorney general, um, but you might want to step away. You, you can only save an organization if it wants to be saved. So you might find other people who to join with you to maybe remove the bad seed. Otherwise, 
you want to be with other people that you enjoy, who are ethical, who are responsible, who want to serve the membership, make the club better, make it enjoyable, make people learn beekeeping, work in their community about beekeeping, um, and have that fellowship at the at the club. But sometimes you do just have to cut bait and walk away. And that's a, that's a healthy thing to do. Thank you so much, you so Michelle. Much. Thank you. Hey, well, thank, thank you. I'm going to unshare so that Debbie can um, okay. give her presentation. So thank you, everybody. I will check out the uh, Q&A if anyone has any other questions, and I will respond there. Thank you. You can read the chat. We are going to take five minutes uh, biological break, and I uh, will come back. And after that, uh, Debbie will be uh, taking over this presentation. Okay. Presentation mode. Okay, I'd like to welcome you back again and uh, with the second presentation here, ABF, the American Bee Federation, what's in it for uh, for you? Our speaker tonight is Debbie Saip and uh, Debbie, if you don't mind, uh, share with us a little bit of your bio and uh, welcome and thank you for sharing your experience with us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I must start out with saying I have been beekeeping since about 1984 when my husband and I got together. And I was one of those people that having been beekeeping in the later years of my life, when I was asked, hey, let's go get in the hive, I my response was, are you crazy? <laughs> so um, it's kind of interesting how people get into beekeeping and what their background was. And mine certainly was in computers. It's tech. Um, it's um, CPA accounting background. So it was, um, when you look at diverse people on a board that Michelle talked about, I am one of probably the diverse people on the board that got into beekeeping later. So I appreciated a lot of her comments. I know that we have both kind of come through the same background. Um, I started serving on the board for a um, state association based on the fact that I was a CPA and there was no one else on the board who knew that, uh, who had that knowledge. So I started there. Um, I went on to become the um, treasurer for the regional association for the same reason. They did not have anybody who had that skill set. And then I now serve on the board for the American Beekeeping Federation. As a state board member, I am one of those people that firmly believes in term limits, and I am terming out in October. So um, while I have put in our bylaws things to try and protect us financially, the response was, well, we'll just change the bylaw so that you can stay on. And that, that to me was the worst response that could have been, and I'm the one who vetoed that response. So um, diversity is, is hugely important to organizations and ABF is the same way. So when I talk about um, what we're going to talk about today, it's more or less how you get where we are, where we start out with, and uh, different things that you get from different levels of organizations. So I would like to thank you all for having me tonight. Um, it's kind of exciting when people ask you to do talks and you think, oh, this is kind of cool. I get to share some knowledge and uh, get to answer some questions. And then I actually get to hear what people really have. Um, they don't really have the knowledge of that we assume they do. So it's kind of interesting and this will be fun for me as well. So please feel free to put your questions down there. And if you don't mind, um, Matt, have, we will just wait until the end to answer them. Okay, so first of all, these are the different organizations that you see, not only across the U.S., but um, above the U.S. as well. So normally people get started, they get started, they have one or two hives, and they go to a local bee club. They're new, they don't really know the questions to ask, so they usually sit in the back, they're quiet, um, and then they realize that after they've been there for a whole year, oh, now I know what you were talking about when you answered that question. Usually local clubs do not have dues. Um, if they do have dues, it's um, we have a $5 minimum dues for the year that covers the coffee and the cookies that somebody brings. 
So those are usually what local clubs do. They will bring in speakers. They will bring in local speakers from their association, and they'll bring in speakers maybe from the state association. And then you go up to the state association and you start getting bigger events. The people at the state association usually are governed by a board of directors. They have bylaws. They have a mission statement. They may or not be a, pro a nonprofit. Um, but what they also do is they govern more about what's happening at the state level. So you want a law passed at the state, um, for instance, we wanted a law passed in Indiana, where they could not prohibit us from keeping bees on our property, no matter where we were. And that affected all beekeepers in the state of Indiana. And that's where you go to the state association to get some of those things done. The events that the state associations usually run are larger, and they bring in national, sometimes international uh, speakers. So as you go up each level, what we like in <clears throat> each level is the type of bees that you have in your beehive. So local clubs, you're usually a newbie. Um, that's what we consider the bees that have just emerged, don't really know what's going on yet, kind of walking around the hives thinking, trying to figure out where they fit. State association, they're more like house bees. You've been there for a while. Now you know what's going on and you're trying to help more promote things in the community and things in the state. And then you move up to regional societies. We have three in the U.S. We are very fortunate about that. Um, and our regional associations, EAS, HAS, WAS, they're more like guard bees. Um, they bring in speakers from across the U.S., but they also bring in speakers in the region, and they address things that actually happen in the region. So um, many times when you go to EAS or when you go to HAS, they're specifically targeting things that are in that area. WAS is the one that I have not participated in. I have not gone to yet. So I'm kind of looking forward to that if maybe I can swing that somehow. Then you go to national associations and national associations are like forager bees. You hear a lot of the issues that are going on across the nation, issues that are affecting all beekeepers across the U.S., not just the ones in your state, your backyard, uh, your regional. So we're more like forager bees. National associations um, go out and they find out what's going on across the nation. They do things in Washington. They do things to help beekeepers across the U.S. They also get involved in things that are happening at an international level. So they're more like forager bees. And then you have an, an international association or international organization, of course, is Appamundia. They are having their conference down in Chile. So um, if any of you have never went to that, it is just an amazing, amazing um, conference to go to. Lots of education, lots of speakers will be there huge expo hall and it's it's just fun it's fun to go and listen to people across the entire world talk about the same topic which is beekeeping and it's interesting to find out that people that are in Chile people that are in China people that are in Canada are having the same issues that the people right here in the U.S. are having as far as beekeeping so those are the different organizations as you go up in different organizations they may have um, a due structure they may have board of directors um, they have either a board of directors or trustees and again most of them have term limits as well for the exact same reason that Michelle had talked about. So what I'm here today mainly to talk about is the American Beekeeping Federation. We are also known as ABF. So I'd like to talk to you about some of the things that we do, um, how we get involved across the United States, how we get involved with uh, Canada as well, <clears throat> and how we work for all beekeepers. Our goal is not to work just for commercial beekeepers or backyard urban beekeepers or sideliners, but it is to ensure the future of the honeybee. And that means we have to be representing all beekeepers, all levels, whether you have one hive, whether you have 5,000 hives, or whether right now you don't have any hives. You, you're one of those um, newbies and you're just kind of getting your feet wet. 
So one of the things that national associations do that mainly uh, state associations don't do at a national level, we have lobbyists, we do legal campaigns over the last few years. These are some of the ones that we have targeted. Um, most of the small beekeepers heard about the added sugar onto a label. They were in Washington trying to pass a bill that we need to put on our label of honey added sugar. And that would be a huge detriment to us. If you go to a farmer's market, you go to a store, you're trying to sell your honey and you've added sugar and you've got an added sugar on the back of it. People are not going to perceive that as pure honey. So um, it's a big turnoff to our consumers, as well as the people in the community who are um, buying from local beekeepers and you're selling it as a local product with nothing added to it. It is just honey from the bees. We had an ELD waiver for livestock and bee haulers. Again, this hit more the commercial people than the smaller people. But what we also have to understand is no matter what level you're at, we are all in this together. It takes all three bees in a hive in order for us to sustain and go forward. So even though you think you're only one or two bees, you only have one or two um, hives, so it doesn't really hurt or help me at all for ELD waiver, what you will find out is if commercial beekeepers all of a sudden can't sustain their numbers, they don't have the numbers to sell to sideliners. Sideliners don't have the numbers to sell to hobbyists. So it all trickles down. Anti-dumping lawsuit, that was a big one for last year. Most of the people on this call have heard about it. If you have not, what literally was happening was there were five countries that were bringing in honey. Some of it was was real honey. Some of it was not. They were dumping it. And that meant the price of the honey in the U.S. was bottoming out. And again, if our commercial beekeepers can't make it, then that affects all beekeepers, whether you are one or two hives or whether you're 5,000 hives. So the anti-dumping lawsuit went after five countries. If you go to our website, you can hear all a lot more about it. The countries that were involved, um, we did win the initial lawsuit. But of course, with all lawsuits, there's going to be follow up and additional follow up and all of those kind of things. What we have been working on over the past six months is opening the Canadian border for beekeepers in the U.S. to be able to sell packages, packages only, nothing with Coleman, over into Canada. There are always two sides to every story. There are a lot of Canadian beekeepers um, that some of them are for it. Some of them are for against it. I think the biggest issue is that the U.S. and the Canadian beekeepers need to get together and decide which is the best and what's best for everybody. So um, I bring that up because that is something that we have been working on very hard for the past six months. It was brought up at the conference in January. I did talk to a couple of people from Canada who were not for it. Um, so you can't lump everything together and say everybody's for opening the Canadian border because that would simply not be a true statement. Um, over the past two months, we've been working on H-2A legislature. They are actually trying to change that so that if you have uh, H-2A workers and that worker, no matter what you brought them in for to do, is at one level of cost, then what actually happens is if that worker, um, say, for instance, decides to drive a van to take 10 of your workers to the grocery store, <clears throat> that instead of paying them the price that you brought them in as a beekeeper, you now have to switch over to paying them a price as a truck driver. And that, of course, makes the cost go up. Costs go up, it affects everybody. And then the Honey Defense Fund, the biggest thing is that we have a campaign out there right now that says know where your honey comes from. <laughs> Basically, it's because, sorry, um, a lot of people will um, go to the grocery store and they will buy honey and they will say, oh, this honey is only uh, $5 for a two pound bottle. And exactly. And then you have other beekeepers that are saying, well, gosh, if I can go to a store, a big chain store, and I can get it for so much cheaper, why would I go to a farmer's market and buy it from a beekeeper? So our whole campaign is centered around um, you get what you pay for, 
know what you're paying for and know where it comes from. And the biggest thing is read the label. The label may say 100% honey, but read the label that says where that honey is actually coming from. If it's outside of the U.S., that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad honey, but you do need to know um, some honey from outside of the U.S., of course, is um, not 100% pure honey. So those are the things that we've been lobbying. Those are the things that we are working with in legislature. You can also see those on our website as well. So here are some of the things of what we do for beekeepers across the United States. And we do this for the people in Canada, for Mexico. We do have um, members that are uh, um, in several other countries as well. First of all, the biggest issue that we have right now is that we are getting honey in that is uh, what we call adulterated, transshipped, or nefarious honey it may not be 100% honey. And I say may not because it makes it look like we're saying all honey from outside the U.S. is bad honey. And that is definitely not what we are saying. We're just saying that some honey, even in the U.S., can be bad honey. Um, and that's what we want to make sure that we, our honey defense fund is um, making sure that we are tracking as well. The other thing is we support bee labs and the scientific community. Some of the three that are on here, of course, we do support a lot more. Randy Oliver, most of you have a following and know Randy Oliver because he is on the West Coast. Jamie Ellis in Florida is down on the East Coast. And Marla Spivak is in the middle. Marla has been around. I, I hope he, she doesn't aff get offended, but I say for years um, because she's very knowledgeable and she has been out there for a lot. A lot of the research that they are doing is helping all beekeepers. Again, um, I remember when Jamie Ellis opened his bee lab in Florida, one of his first things was we have to get control of these varroa mites. Every year we stand up here and we talk about varroa mites. Um, this year is, is a little refreshing that instead of talking about varroa mites this year, um, they stood up and talked about the tea mite. So that was one of the issues that that is now coming up as the big issue that we're going to have to watch for. So we do uh, support Beltsville Bee Lab and some of the other bee labs across the U.S. as well. We put out a quarterly newsletter uh, that comes out. We're so creative in our names in beekeeping. You notice that the J-Hook Hive tool looks like a J-Hook. I, I always laugh about that. Um, our quarterly newsletter is called the quarterly newsletter because it comes out once a quarter. So that's our creative names. Um, we do have a roster that goes out that has not only the beekeepers that are members, but it also has beekeepers that are dealers, beekeepers that sell bees, beekeepers that sell packages and that sell comb and that buy honey and that sell honey. So those are all things in our roster as well. And then we support our American Honey Queen and Princess. And the American Honey Queen and Princess goes to different states, different events. All you have to do is request their presence. And um, as long as they can get you on their calendar, that's through Anna Kettlewell. She actually can help you get involved with the Honey Queen and Princess program. Usually you will get either the queen or the princess um, because they are so, so busy, especially this time of year. They do a lot of talks. They do a lot of radio. They do uh, TV interviews. And their goal, again, is to promote beekeeping in our industry. And they just do a fabulous job of that. This is, a, this is a sample of our quarterly newsletter that was in 2022. You will see some of the things that were in the issue. Of course, we usually always have, uh, what are we doing for our members and how are we serving our mission? Because again, if we're not serving our mission, then that's something we probably shouldn't be doing. And those are all the things that you can see that we do as well. The announces the 4-H the essay winners, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. And then the Appamondia recap that we had down there. 
We do educational webinars. Our next webinar coming up is June 4th at 8 o'clock. You can go on our website and you can see all the newest ones. Uh, but Sunday, June 4th, most of them are also are, are usually on a Sunday night and they're every three to four weeks and they're at 8 p.m. And that allows the people that are in the West Coast uh, a five o'clock meeting instead of uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. Our next one is Dr. Jerry Hayes. He is with Bee Culture Magazine, and it's going to be a question and answer session. If you go to our website, which I will show you our website here in a little bit, you actually can click on the register here button. Um, Jerry Hayes is very entertaining, so he will, and he has a lot of knowledge as well. So you'll enjoy that. The dues for the American Beekeeping Federation are based on the number of hives. We are looking at changing that. Why? Because we've always done the number of hives and it's time for someone to say, does that make the most sense? So that's what we're, we're taking a look at that. 5% of all the dues that are paid actually support the American Honey Queen program, which means 5% of your, if you're a small scale, $60, 5% of that $60 helps our queens be able to travel and do what they do to help our industry and to support our beekeeping. We have a yearly conference. The next one coming up is in New Orleans. It's in Louisiana, January 9th through the 12th. It's 2024. Um, our guest speaker, our keynote speaker already is the um, Frank Rankovich. He is with the Beltsville Bee Lab. And we have Sammy Ramsey coming back. And again, his sole talk will be about um, the trophy mites. So um, a lot of people are interested on what exactly is going on with that and why is that now such a critical issue uh, and what we need to do to be prepared for that. But since we are on the West Coast, many of you are on the West Coast, I thought I would bring up where we're going to be in 2025. We are already signed a contract with Reno, Nevada. We're going to be at the Pepper Mill and it will be January 7th through the 10th. Again, that will be in 2025. So hopefully you guys can save the dates because that will be very, very close to you guys. We put together an eBuzz, which is our electronic um, issue. Part of the reason why we started with that many, many years ago, Tim Tucker, our past president, started that because the quarterly comes out once a quarter. So let's say the quarterly comes out, we just got a quarterly um, just this yesterday or the day before. What happens if on Friday, some major, major issue hits our beekeeping industry and everybody needs to know about right away? We can't wait for another three months for the quarterly to come out. So they said electronic once a month at the end of the month is actually the way to address that. Now, if it was super, super critical, of course, we do put something on our website, we post on our Facebook page, and we also um, send it out to our membership. But um, this is one way to get information out to our members as quickly as possible as well. Yeah. The Foundation for the Preservation of the Honeybees. There are two um, distinct groups within the American Beekeeping Federation. The American Beekeeping Federation is nonprofit. We do lobbying, we do go to Washington, and we um, advocate on your behalf. But the, we are also a 501c7 because we're a member organization. We started the Foundation for the Preservation of Honeybees as a nonprofit 501c3. And that was so people could donate money that they wish to donate that we would segregate that money for a specific purpose. And this purpose is basically for preserving honeybees. And um, some of the, the great things they do are, first of all, their charitable education and research. So they sponsor all of the webinars that we talked about. We talked about Jerry Hayes, Larry Connor was just on there, but they actually sponsor those webinars. They give out four annual scholarships a year. They are given out at our conference, $5,000 scholarships a piece to aviculture graduate students in 2024. They are, um, the application is out there and they are not tied strictly to the US. So please, if you hear this, you understand this, make sure that you go out there and take a look at the policies, the rules, uh, what it takes to put in an application for this. 
In addition, if you're one of the four chosen, we reimburse you for your conference travel and lodging expenses. Because <clears throat> it's one thing if we give you a $5,000 scholarship, and then you have to spend $1,000 traveling to the conference kind of defeats part of the purpose. So we want to do that. Another big thing that the Foundation for the Preservation of the Honeybees does is they sponsor the Kids and Bees program. The Kids and Bees program reaches hundreds and hundreds of kids on a yearly basis just at the conference alone. We get all the local kids to come um, and they get to do fun things. What we are trying to do is educate our next generation, and we're trying to get them at a very young age where they have not been instilled the fear of bees from their parents. So that's one big thing that the Kids and Bees does. Um, and they learn not only about bees, they learn about their biology, about their legs and their wings and their eyes, but they also do fun things. They get to make uh, bee hats and bee socks. And um, as they're going around from station to station, they get to talk to the honey queens. They get to talk to the honey princesses. They get to talk to other beekeepers that are there and how they see them progress. It's just a great, great day. It's about three hours, um, along with the things that they do outreach throughout the year. But the ones three hours at the conference are a great way for these kids. And you, it's just so exciting when they come in, you know, they're all excited and they're all smiling and boy, when they go out and they've got some little bee they made um, it's, it's just a great way for them to, um, to get turned on to bees and know about it when they're young. The other thing that we do is we have state sponsorships, and I'm very excited. One of the things I my responsibility is the state delegates. This past year, we had 27 states that were a state sponsor for ABF. Now, 27 states means that over half of our states actually were a sponsor at different levels. These are the different levels that we have. And then based on the different levels, there are certain things that you get, of course. If you are a platinum, which last year we had five, I believe this year we will have seven states, you actually get a complimentary family registration, which is two adults that actually get to the conference for free. You get to use the virtual presentations, the education things that we just talked about. And there are other things that you get as you go gold, silver, or bronze. The levels of sponsorship for a state is not based on the number of members that you have in your state. It's based on the level of what your state agrees when you go to your board and say, we'd like to be a state sponsor of ABF. Um, you all look at your budget. Be responsible when you decide what that budget level is going to be. And then these are all the different things that you get as a, um, a state sponsorship. We like to thank all our state sponsors because we are very excited to have so many last year. So you can hear the buzzing in the background. We like to ask why ABF matters to everybody. First of all, as you all know, we are facing unprecedented challenges, disease, pest, uh, things coming in at all levels of beekeeping. That means we are getting problems at the hobbyist level, the sideliner, and the commercial beekeeping level. And only together can we solve these issues that are before us, and we need to get a handle on them before they make us be solved. We are your voice in Washington. In June, our president, vice president go to um, Washington. We do have a lobbyist. Most of you may know Fran Boyd. He is our lobbyist and he actually sets all that up. We get to talk to the um, Department of Ag. So those are all the people. There are lots of people involved in that, in the bills that are being signed, the farm bill that gets signed. That is critical for us to have people on board out there. Um, and we get to talk to those people to let them know what exactly are the issues that we need them to focus on um, for our beekeeping in our industry. We'd like to know that we are one. We are one voice. We are one beekeeping group. ABF does work on your behalf. Um, if you would like to become a member, this is where you can go to see our membership. If you just like to see some of the programs that we're about, you can still go to abfnet.org um, and you can go to all the different pages that you see out there. 
One thing that we do across the United States for our for state organizations is we have something called resources and a swarm control list. As you can imagine, right now, we are getting inundated with people who have swarms in their backyard. Um, I personally sit in Indiana, right outside Indianapolis, and I can't tell you how many people call me and say, can you come and get this swarm? By the way, I'm in California. Um, and, and I kind of want to laugh because to them, they do not realize that. They don't know where I'm sitting. Um, but we do point them to our website. We point them to all 50 states have a link there. I encourage our states to go out there and check to make sure their link hasn't changed, to, to their website hasn't changed, and now their link no longer works. But those are just some of the things that we do across the states and across the U.S. for our beekeepers, sharing with the people that are in Canada, sharing with the people that are in Mexico, and sharing with some of our other countries as well. Um, I have not seen questions, don't know if there are any, but what I'd like to do at this point is unshare my screen <clears throat> in case you do have any, uh, or in case you do have uh, any questions for Michelle. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, nice presentation. And even though I've been in Canada here for the last uh, 30 some years, and I was before that in California, but I still go to ABF oh, meeting, annual meeting. And actually for uh, the meeting, the upcoming meeting, meeting in New Orleans, the American Association of Professional Apiculturists, they are going to be also attending the same meeting and we have our little conference in the same uh, hotel with you guys, as well as the apiary inspectors of America. That's and usually correct. we keep our usually we keep our doors open for any uh, members of ABF attending the meeting to come and listen to some of the scientific talks or uh, some of the presentation we have in our little conference too. Yep, we okay. have already got your rooms um, set up and secured. <laughs> so that was I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a good meeting because it's rounded up and brings uh, almost uh, all the apiculturists or people working in the field in terms of research and extension and regulation together in one hotel and you have access to all of these members at the same time. But I encourage everyone, uh, if you haven't made it yet to ABF, that's a place to go and to start with. So that's a great opportunity for learning and meeting people and uh, uh, yeah, socializing. And it's it's good time of the year to start the new year with this kind of activity. This um, conference, I will tell you, we are changing some things up. We're going back to the um, Larry Connor used to have a three track lead. Um, we had kind of went away from that. And some of our small scale beekeepers said, you know, I go for two days, I sit and talk and don't hear things that really pertain to me, although they will in a couple of years realize they do. Uh, so we have gone back to now having three tracks. We have one for commercial, one for sideliner, uh, one for our small scale. And in addition to that, um, um, since I'm actually on that committee, I will tell you that there are a lot of fun things that we're now adding that have not been there for a while. So uh, thank you for that, Medhart. I really would like uh, to encourage everybody, if you'd like to attend, reach out if you have some questions for me, but it's definitely going to be a great uh, conference this year. Actually, I was one of the speakers most of the time with Larry Connor for teaching some of these classes. And uh, uh, yeah, it was fun uh, to meet most of these people uh, during that time too. And yeah, it's, it's uh, as I said, it's a good place to have new information and meet different speakers and the education forum, it's great. Okay, uh, we will open the floor for any question uh, for the two speakers. And uh, frankly, today I learned a lot about some of this kind of uh, Things happen behind the scene and how to actually to address this, these issues. Uh, 
with Michelle talk early on and uh, now with the ABF uh, present uh, presentation to give us also an idea about how a successful organization has been running and the services they can offer the industry. Well, so Michelle, Matt, had, if, yeah, if I could kind of to combine and connect Debbie's presentation and and what I was talking about setting up strategic plans for your nonprofit B club is to look at those things. It's not just a membership in ABF. It is also looking at part of your mission is how do you support beekeeping? And with ABF having those two foundations, that is a way for you within your club budget to say, why don't we give, whether it's an annual contribution or maybe every two years, but how, or even a special fundraiser to raise money to give to those nonprofit foundations, because you as a nonprofit can do that, your bee club. And that's how you are helping to grow the industry and providing those, that fund, those funds to support those foundations um, at ABF, because those foundations are 501c3s certainly encourage your members because it is a charitable donation, tax deductible charitable donation an individual gets by donating to those foundations. So that's something that the, the clubs can look at as their strategic planning, their budgeting for the year. How can they support those foundations that are supporting the mission of your organization, which is all about beekeeping education? And that's what those foundations are for. Actually, Michelle, in addition to that, in uh, some associations here, at least I'm familiar with in Canada, we have our association, especially the uh, provincial ones, it's like the state ones. They also have uh, some research fund. It goes towards uh, supporting research activities for the organization itself. And that really helps to take this money from the industry and multiply it by matching funds from the provincial and federal government. Right. And that really and, will grow up the money to do more research uh, to serve the industry at all levels. Right. And, and research desperately needs money. And when we have our local clubs, some of them that have been around for decades, often have these huge bank accounts. It is up to the membership to say, how are we contributing to the industry? How are we contributing to the research? If you have $100,000 in your bank account for the club, what are you doing with that money? It should not just sit there waiting for someone to embezzle it. It really needs to be put to use. How can the board leadership ensure that the, the funds that are raised by the organization support the organization, but support the beekeeping industry as well? Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, member of the panelists uh, wants to ask questions or add to this information? We still have a few minutes here. Well, I do see somebody in the chat asking about making beekeeping legal. I, you know, I, I think Debbie, I think most of us will agree. It really has to be city by city. Um, um, beekeeping is, I don't know that, I mean, you can get some of it if you have that right to farm, but you're still going to have some cities who will manipulate that concept of beekeeping and farming. I know in Ohio, yes, you can keep bees, but every city has home rule. So we what's your actually, experience? Um, Michelle, we were able to accomplish that in Indiana. Okay. Yep. Well, it, can't, it, can't do it in Ohio because of home yeah. rule. So yeah. Um, it it took having someone who is uh, an elected official. We used to call him a politician. He was an elected official um, who became a champion of our cause, and um, we were able not only to do it, but we were able to get it passed in four months, which was wow. unheard of. Yes. Yes. And uh, and now we have a governor that has beehives on his property. Um, we have, and that was part of it is being good neighbors, being good stewards, answering the questions from um, homeowner associations who originally opposed it and said, okay, we can regulate this. One was we put in, in place that um, in order to have beehives in certain cities or in certain counties, you have to come to our bee school and be certified that you know how to keep bees and that you know, you're not gonna have them swarm and all that kind of thing. So it was uh, difficult. We kind of went after uh, West Virginia 
to see with how they did it. And uh, so state by state would, would have probably some challenges, but yes, we were able to do that in Indiana. Very, yeah, and, very and, and again, it can be done in some states and that's where it's good, as you said, Debbie, to, to the beekeepers have to come together. But I know like in my state in Ohio, there's home rule and it took me four years just to get milkweed, goldenrod and daisies legal because <laughs> it was illegal to plant them in my community. And some of it's simply because of home rule issues. But certainly beekeepers, again, need to collaborate with the chicken people. I hate to, yes. you know, the people who want chickens for that urban farming and to, to you know, build that sense of community. So you can go to the state like you guys did in Indiana and say, we have this right to farm. Um, and there are ways, that, yes, you can protect things, but sometimes you do have to fight city by city. Yeah. In, my, oh. in my county, we had to go to every city. In our, um, one of the other things that helped us is right before we got the bill to be <clears throat> voted on, there was a city that was strictly opposed to it. And they got a swarm and they got a swarm right downtown at their market, right before market opened. And they wanted to beekeeper come and get them. Couldn't get a beekeeper to come get them because then you were literally saying, I'm breaking the law because yes, I'm a beekeeper. Right. Um, right. At that point, they became on board with us. And, okay, and uh, yeah, so it, it, you know, everything just kind of came together at, at right. the point we needed it to. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Hi, um, this is Ron. Uh, Michelle, I have a question for you, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Yes. You mentioned er early on the idea that uh, Rogers, uh, Rogers, Roberts oh. rules, not Rogers, Roberts rules <laughs> are, are, um, often invoked as the final authority for conducting a meeting and you gave a good example of why that doesn't always work now what would you recommend for facilitating a smooth meeting where people feel like there uh is a policy in place and you know you voted or you've nominated you asked for three nominee whatever whatever right. the what do you recommend well, there are a couple different ways out there. So you want to look at what works for you. I think I did a blog on my website about this, but certainly you can easily Google nonprofit um, uh, just member meetings and how to run them. And there, there's one that's called Martha's Rules, which is that is really simple. So, you know, it is a lot of it's a matter of let's be polite. Let's listen to each other. Let's um, organize it so that we are able to make a decision. Because when Robert's rules can get so cumbersome, and then again, you'll get that cantankerous person who does know Robert's rules, but they really just don't want anyone to make a decision. So there are a variety of formats out there that you can find one that suits you, suits your leadership style, some of it. Again, it can it can be something that changes with each officer or, or president so that it suits your style. But really, it, it is that simple as um ways to manage a nonprofit member meeting and google that yeah and you'll come up with a variety of those at things like um the nonprofit national nonprofit council they'll have examples but it's just we all think robert's rules it's like no stop it it's so there are other things out there as well as all of you just agreeing you know write it up for yourself even how will we have a meeting how long will be a discussion about any issue then is it a majority vote? Please just go majority. Don't go consensus. We'll never get anything done. Um, and, and move forward from there, but allow that discussion about any issue so that everybody understands it. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Oh, and somebody put in the chat my uh, thank you for, wow, somebody was speedy. You went and got my blog post, the uh, pitfalls of putting Robert's Rules of Order in your bylaws. Yes. Yeah. All right. So it's right there in the chat. Thank you. Uh, th uh, thank you for doing that. <laughs> thank you again. Uh, I think somebody put something else again in the chat. Yeah, same uh, thing, actually. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people went right to my website. Well, yay. And ah, don't forget we ADF's go. Yeah, that's website. Right. <laughs> it can uh, teach you a lot that's as well. Exciting. <laughs> that's great. All right. Um, I guess if we don't have any questions, uh, I am really privileged tonight to hear these two talks. And uh, I'm being in the bees and working with bees for quite a long time, sometimes just they get tired of listening to bees all the time. <laughs> Even though that's not happening, but 
uh, it's great to hear this kind of uh, uh, information to help everybody around. Thanks again, and uh, it, uh, thank, uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see some of you in uh, ABF next time. And uh, also the WAS meeting in Calgary. Ron, do you wanna add a couple of things about WAS meeting in addition to what Ethan said? And, uh, there I go. I was just trying to unmute myself again. Thank you, Medhat. Um, yeah, we're just excited to have this thing, and and uh, we have so much to show off. The city has about a million and a half people. We're close to the Rocky Mountains, close to the Badlands. Um, all kinds of cultural events going on all the time around here. Um, it's a nice uh, metropolis. In fact, um, uh, it's it's has been recently voted by The Economist magazine, for what it's worth, as the most livable city in all of North America. So that's where this WAS meeting will be, the end of uh, September, beginning of October, and we'd be thrilled to have uh, have people show up for all the good talks that Etienne has mentioned, as well as, as just to have the experience of being in Calgary. So thank you, Medhat. Thank you, thank you. Thanks again, everybody, and have a good evening. And um, thanks, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.